So, um, uh, Dirk van Damme, it's really a pleasure uh, that we have the opportunity to jump into this uh, raw interview. We were inspired here in the EPIC uh, conference in Rotterdam, uh, which is taking place around digital transformation. And you gave a keynote that made us uh, what you uh, ask uh, the system to do, more critical thinking. Um, so we have some uh, food for thoughts and some questions and uh, we are very happy to, to use this opportunity directly here. Um, one thing that came to my uh, mind that I may like to start with, um, you were talking about the uh, curriculum dimension that needs redesign. Um, that it's a new, um, uh, that you want to turn the pyramid uh, and, and flip in this sense how we uh, teach and learn in universities. What exactly do you have in mind? What is needed to change here? Yeah, well, that's not an easy question. <laughs> the whole question of curriculum redesign, um, I, I'm a bit hesitant to answer in just very simple terms. And so it's, it's, a, it's rather complicated. Um, but first of all, what I would like to stress is that the whole, let's say, the digital innovation movement in higher education has focused on the how question. And I think it's absolutely important to focus on the what. What should students learn? Uh, what would we like them um, to learn from their teachers, from the programs? How should we redesign the programs, etc.? Um, there is a general shift from knowledge to skills. Um, but there is also the risk of going too far into the skills movement and, and to make higher education vocational. I think higher education should still be focusing on, on advanced thinking, on critical thinking, on academic knowledge. But the, the, the relationship between knowledge and skills is, is, um, is changing. So knowledge remains important. I will never say that knowledge is not no longer important uh, and many people are making exaggerated statements about that google knows everything and that we don't have to teach uh, knowledge anymore i think you have to have um, a deep dive into uh, a domain of knowledge can be interdisciplinary domain because the disciplines are no longer in my view the, the most appropriate ways to organize knowledge but you have to take a deep dive and to be able to develop analytical thinking, critical thinking skills, and then move to yeah, transfer and, and developing those generic skills at the higher level. But that's the whole challenge. The risk is superficiality, that you jump too easily into interdisciplinary. We see a lot of examples in higher education institutions, things which are named as interdisciplinary, which are just very superficial. Uh, so you need to have this deep dive and then do the transfer in appropriate ways and not just putting people together from different disciplines that doesn't make a curriculum interdisciplinary. So uh, it's a very complicated challenge and we don't see clear answers on every question, but it is for me the, the way to go. And digitalization can help to do that because digital can also reorganize content in different ways. Um, so uh, it, it is no longer about tools, about methods, about delivery modes. It's also about how to reorganize the, the content and the learning resources associated. Mm -hmm. may, may I follow up? Um, what do you think is the role of the ed tech industry and also NGOs? But, uh, because there is a lot of content available on YouTube, on other platforms but also inside of civil organization, NGO, Greenpeace and so on. Yeah. And what would their role be in the future of higher ed? Because you can argue on the one side and it's always been portrayed university as this iron pillar, the, the wisdom of knowledge and nobody should go inside. Yeah. Um, but as, as you argued and uh, if I remember correctly, there is a, a change of educational landscape uh, that's a big topic, changing the educational uh, landscape. So what would, we, uh, what would be the role of these yeah. NGOs? Yeah, another good question. Um, first of all, I have a lot of sympathy for universities. I'm, I'm an academic myself. Mm -hmm. I will never <laughs> betray universities. I have a lot of sympathy. They have a hard time. Um, but they still have this 18th, 19th century paradigm that everything is closed behind their walls 
the books are behind the walls uh, and the university professors uh, in their rooms and etc. Um, opening up the university will be part of the digital transformation. That's that's for sure. Um, how that will happen is is uh, I'm, I'm not sure. So I, I will, I'm always very prudent at making very strong predictions, and I I avoid the word <laughs> disruption. I avoid, avoid the word revolution. But opening up university, bringing new sources uh, and, and new barriers of knowledge into academia, that's definitely going to be part of the picture. Uh, and that's happening, of course, if you are using technology, you are using resources available on the internet, etc. Um, but it's, it is actually the question of what, what will be the new role of the university professor, or the teacher, or the, or the professional staff. They will become more researchers, uh, architects, engineers, rather than having all the knowledge into their own heads and then just distributing it. Um, so it will require a mind shift of the uni university staff, university leaders. Um, but I think the main argument that they have against opening up is not all the knowledge is trustworthy and reliable. And that's a valid argument. So they they want to stay in control of what kind of knowledge enters the curriculum, um, and I think that's for good reasons. But your well, the fears can be exaggerated as well. You, it's it's like learning to swim. At one point in time, you have to jump into the water and swim, um, and to be critical uh, at the same time. Um, but yeah, opening up will be part of the game, that's for sure. And what advice would you give to faculties and the students for curriculum development? Where should it start? What's, what's the first? What's the um, well, to be very reflective. Um, because well, I'm very anxious. If I, or, or prudent if I see some of these changes happening in institutions which in the end are extremely superficial, um, as, I, as I said. So um, students have a much more consumerist attitude. Um, and of course we, we would like to give more power to students to get ownership of their own learning trajectory, their, their, even their curriculum development, to uh, assemble bits and pieces into a coherent uh, curriculum development, etc. But some of these things are just confirming the consumerist attitudes of students. So in my view, students should um, enable or should get ownership of their own learning trajectory, not only be the objects of, of teaching and learning environment, they become much more active participants in the teaching and learning experience, but they should do that much more reflectively. What is actually my purpose? What is my goal? What, what, what do I want to achieve in those three, four, five years that, um, that I have this unique opportunity paid by the by society to have this experience? Um, and they, yeah, sometimes they, it, it may sound a little bit critical, but sometimes they are just, um, what is the easiest road? To, to succeed and to get this little paper. Um, and this attitude is is not going to work. This will be, I think, society and the economy will not uh, reward uh, the, this kind of consumerist attitudes. Just a very interesting point, and I like to contrast it with, with something that we have um, experienced over the last course of the last years. Um, we call them digital change makers. So we mm -hmm. invite students to take a different role because we believe that this sort of transformational process within the institution needs the student focus and not only talk about them, but involve them. And once you give them ownership, you have a different situation where maybe the consumer part is much less emphasized. Oh, and if I look into, uh, and that was my core, let's say, um, feeling when I listened to you, when I look at um, the next generation on the uh, Fridays, uh, future uh, Friday demonstrations, I see a generation that is in the driver's seat to call upon us for a different way of working in the system, of handling our global challenges uh, in terms of climate change. So 
I do see other forms of student participation and, and the interesting question is if this is not relating also to the how. How do we actually treat them? How do we actually work with students in the institution? If I look at the old Humboldt model, uh, you had a different approach of how to engage. And uh, this is maybe the core, one of the core questions for me, how can you do that in the 21st century institution that needs to survive because we need it for our whole system? Yeah. No, I think that's a very positive uh, story. Uh, I think giving students not only a voice, but also the ownership of their teaching and learning experience, uh, together with staff. I don't believe, as I said in my talk, in the purely individualistic, personalized learning, the, the individual learner behind the screen, and etc. Um, learning happens with digital media or without in the encounter. Um, and that's that's going to be absolutely necessary. I, I don't believe in, uh, and that was the, one of the reasons why for me MOOCs have been a failure. This idea that maybe the very highly developed uh, meta learning capable adult learner can, can do that uh, on his own, but these are exceptions. This is not a rule, certainly not for younger students. Um, so, but giving them the power to, to co-construct their learning experience, uh, I think that's, uh, that's the, the way to go. Absolutely. Well, we really appreciate your readiness uh, and uh, the av availability um, to talk to us. Uh, we're looking forward to maybe invite you at some point to Berlin, uh, to Germany, to continue this discussion. Thanks for today and hopefully have a nice return. Okay, uh, it's my pleasure. Thank yeah, you so thank much. You very much. Thank you.